جين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد والثناء لله رب العالمين بارئ الخلائق أجمعين باعث الأنبياء والمرسلين ثم الصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا وحبيب قلوبنا وطبيب نفوسنا وشفيع ذنوبنا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المكرمين المنتجبين لا سيما بقية الله في العالمين روحي وأرواح العالمين لتراب مقدمه الفداء ولعنة الله على أعدائهم أجمعين إلى قيام يوم الدين For the hastening the return of our Imam please be said the salawat اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد Before I continue with the discussion that we've been following over the course of this last week I wanted to talk, and inshallah for the following nights, we'll try to do this. At the beginning of the talk, maybe about five minutes, we'll try to uh, discuss some of the forgotten, maybe I would call it, forgotten ahkam. Um, but before that, I need to mention an intro. First point in the intro is the importance of ahkam. We have two extremes when it comes to dealing with ahkam. One extreme is the only thing that we look at in Islam is ahkam. Right? Everything, all the time spent in religion is about the intricate details and then sometimes fighting over those details and looking at things in a very, very ritualistic way. The ahkam are important, but not to the extent that we set everything else aside, we set akhlaq aside, we uh, set beliefs aside. We don't get into the spirit of Islam, we don't get to the soul. The prayer just becomes pronouncing dhad as dhad and not za, And the whole purpose becomes that. That is an extreme. That's not something that the Ahlul Bayt taught us to do. That's going over. But another extreme is um, not taking ahkam important enough. Not taking it as serious as it should be. Some people even make this comment. They say, you know, what Islam really wants is that your heart is pure. What you do is it's not really important. It's okay. You don't have to really worry about this dhabiha thing. What are the rules? It doesn't really matter. Okay, you have to have a, a pure soul. You shouldn't oppress people. Right? I want to address this uh, particular ideology. When we commemorate the Ahlul Bayt, we have love for them. We come together. We hold programs for them. 19 through 21st of Ramadan, we commemorate Amir al-Mu'mineen in Muharram, sometimes for an entire month. We commemorate Imam al-Hussein sallallahu the events that took place in Karbala. We remember the end of the month of Safar, we remember the Holy Prophet, Imam al-Mujtaba, Imam al-Ridha, we remember these Imams. We commemorate. Why? Because we have love, we have respect. All right. Now I want to give you an example, maybe for us to, to understand this a little better. Is that a salawat, please? Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. If you really like somebody and you go to them, you really, really like them, okay? You go to their house, for example, and they give you a gift that they consider very important. They give you a gift. How would it feel, or just imagine somebody comes to your house, the other way around. Somebody comes to your house, and you like them, you have love for them, and you give them something. You give them a gift. You think it's important for them to have that. And they come in, they also show love, like, I love you, this, that, the other, they hug. And then on the way out, right in front of me, they take that gift and then they just throw it in the trash. 
Now, how would you feel if somebody did that to you? I don't think you'd like that. The Ahlul Bayt gave their lives, gave their blood, gave their children, gave their families, they gave everything, they sacrificed so that they deliver this message to you and I. If, I, if we look at the compilations of hadith, 30 volumes of Wasail al-Shia, most of the ahadith deal with these ahkam. Sometimes people disrespect it, they put it down, they're like, oh, who cares, you know. Sometimes I hear people who like this idea of unity between uh, Muslims, which is a great idea, but sometimes some versions of it are a bit extreme again. They say, oh, what does it matter? You go like this or like this. It doesn't really matter. Oh, it does matter. Who says it doesn't matter? If it didn't matter, the Holy Prophet wouldn't open his mouth and say, this is how you pray. Okay. If it didn't matter that you pray full or qasr, the Ahlul Bayt wouldn't spend that time to mention it so many times that it's recorded in hadith books and then tell his companions, write that down. And then we've gotten all of this guidance that they have given their blood for. Like, thank you, we love you, but... <laughs> That's what we're doing. When we don't implement it, I really don't know what that love means. What are we doing when we commemorate? So the ahkam are important. Otherwise, Imam al-Sadaq wouldn't spend all that time explaining that. He wouldn't argue with those who disagreed and said, no, the ruling of God is this. And condemn that. And tell people, you have no right to make your own laws. These are God's laws. You can't change them. Alright. So the first point is the importance of ahkam. Second point is, okay, if they're important, I want to implement. Let's go. Let's start. Well, I've got to know my ahkam, right? So we've got to learn what those ahkam are. It's very important. We have to spend the time. Now, when we want to go and learn, how do we do this? We go pick up the Holy Quran, we pick up Hadith. There's 30 volumes. Have you ever seen Wasa'il al-Shia, the 30 volumes of it? We pick it up, can we read it? Do we even understand what it's saying? Even if we can understand it, we're Arabs or whatever, we have learned Arabic. But do we know the background of that? How much of this? This is We're living 1,400 years after the Holy Prophet. 30 volumes. It says the Holy Prophet said this. Oh, were you there? Did you hear him say that? Did you hear Imam al-Sadaq say that? Because it says it here, that means he's actually said it? Uh, I don't know. What means do we have to verify this is actually said by the Ma'asul or not? It's a process. Then when you have a hadith there, and then another verse... Or another hadith, one says pray when sun sets. There's a hadith that says these people were coming from Iraq, Shia. In the horizon, the sun had just set. You know when the sun sets in a desert, the horizon is still, it's not red even, it's yellow. Okay, It's still very, very bright, but you don't see the sun. Okay, Because the horizon is completely clear. So from a distance, they're seeing this man praying when the sun just set. And he's praying his Maghrib prayer. So they're telling himself, yeah, you know, this guy must be one of the <laughs> other guys. It's not a Shia. They arrive there, they see it's Imam al-Sadiq, Salaam Imam al-Sadiq was praying Maghrib prayer right when the sun set, according to this hadith. Okay, so how do I put this together? One says you don't pray until that redness in the sky moves above your head about 20 minutes or 12, 18, depending on where you're at, minutes later. The other one says the Imam was praying when the sun had just set. So how, do we do, how do we deal with this? Okay, It's not easy. Sometimes people think, I don't know for what reason, when it comes to uh, going to the doctor, we don't give ourselves the liberty of you know writing up prescriptions and saying yeah you know here, here's what you need to do of course sometimes we make that mistake too <laughs> i don't know if you come across people like that i have a cold or i have this problem and then quickly you know you take this you take that herb and honey like this and the other way and yeah you're you're, you're done i have abdominal pain they'll write you up a prescription very very quickly okay look it's an area of expertise that requires work, it needs study. When it comes to Islam as well, it's not something that you can easily do. 
All right? It requires, it's very easy for us to make comments about the Ahkam. Oh, traveling eight Farsah, that's four, 1400 years ago. The Holy Prophet didn't mean it for today. What proof do you have? The verse of the Holy Quran scares us. It says, Allah Did God permit you to say that this is from Him? This is the law? Or are you making it up yourself? You're making it up. That's one of the greatest sins. You better be ready for some real good punishment in the hereafter. God forbid. So, the second point is that when we want to learn, we either go become experts and comment on the laws as experts, which the door is open, and you're not limited. It's not like you've got to be from a particular background or you have to go to a particular... Anytime you like, just go over there, become an expert. Alhamdulillah, great, the more the merrier. In fact, that's what Islam encourages. Go become the expert. But if we're not experts, we need the help of an expert to figure out what those laws are. I don't have the time to spend. Right? I need to go to an expert. Otherwise, how do I know? How do I have a proof between me and God that I'm trying to follow His rulings? Okay? So that's the concept behind taqlid. One question that arises sometimes is that, well, what do we do with all these differences? Okay. And there are differences. Inshallah, Eid is going to come. <laughs> we'll see some of the differences. Okay. Okay. One says optical aid is sufficient. The other says optical aid is not sufficient. We go there, we're able to spot it with the optical aid, but not with the naked eye. So what are we supposed to do here? So this causes people to say, you know what? This is all belong. Forget it. It's not really that important. Or what do we do about this? One thing that I want to say, this is a long discussion, but one thing to clear, out of, clear it up for a lot of people. When we look at the time of the Ma'asumin, at the time of Imam al-Sadiq, at the time of Imam al-Kadim, at the time of Imam al-Rida, these differences of opinion about what the Ahlul Bayt have said existed. I'll give you one example. There's a companion in Basra. He's a well-known, acceptable, Companion, and he's a faqih, right? Meaning that he has studied. He has read the books handed down to him from the companions of Imam al-Sadiq. He's even gone to the Ma'asumin. He's learned a lot. He's a full scholar. A person from Basra that's not a scholar goes to Medina, visits and meets the Imam, asks him a faqih question. The Imam responds to him. The guy comes back to Basra. And he tells people, I went and uh, visited the Imam, and the Imam told me, you know, this particular ruling. The scholar tells him, no. That's not the view of the Imam. I know he said it, yeah, but he was doing taqif. <laughs> okay. So this guy is like, really? And so he goes again to Medina, and he says, this is what happened. <laughs> I... Once there, I told people what, I, what you told me, and they said it's taqiyya. He said, no, this is my view. He went to Basra, the companion said, no, 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 <laughs> that's taqiyya. Even this time it was taqiyya, because you don't have the capacity to take the actual ruling. Right? Very strong opinions, based on the ahadith. The Arabic didn't tell people at that point, hey, don't go to these scholars and ask your questions come directly to us. You have to travel all the way. The Imams were there. It's not like our time that we don't have the Imam. We can't ask the Imam for, for those questions. We have no choice but... At that time they could have gone. The Imam could have said, look people, don't go to Zurara, don't go to this person, don't go to Yunus ibn Abdul Rahman. Come directly to me. Right. Not only did the Arabi not say that, when they were in a city, they said, don't come to me, go to this guy. Right? There's something up with that. Whatever the philosophy is, I don't want to get into that. That has its own question to ask, why? Alright, it's a good question to try to look into. But practically, what I'm trying to convey is that these differences exist, and they have existed. They are minor differences. They do not cause a split in our community. We should not fight over it. And it still means that we've got to try to identify the most qualified expert and follow their view. Now that intro took a lot longer than I thought. Uh, inshallah, tomorrow the ahkam themselves won't take that long. We said it's not about this.
<coughs> we're talking about du'as. Tomorrow night, inshallah, is going to be the last night of the A'mal. According to some of the Ahadith, it is going to be Laylatul Qadr. The actual Laylatul Qadr, according to some of the Ahadith, is the night of the 23rd. Of course, some of the other Ahadith suggest to us that there's this, each of those nights, the night of the 19th, the night of the 21st, and the night of the 23rd, there's something that happens on those nights related to what will happen over the course of the next year. All right? It doesn't happen all at one night, but the final version of it, things are finalized on the night of the 23rd. Okay. So if we haven't done a good job, personally I know I haven't, uh, inshallah we have one more night. Okay. So we want to make our du'as. We want to make sure that these du'as are good. We've talked about that. What we arrived at was the idea that sometimes the du'as themselves are the reason why the call is not answered. What we are asking. We have to be very careful as to what we ask. Right. Salah, what, please? Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. And sometimes what we ask for may even be responded to. It may be accepted, but we actually pray that it's not accepted. Remember yesterday we said that sometimes God, we push for something, we ask for something, He gives it to us, but it's actually bad for us. It's not even good for us. And when He doesn't give it to us, it's good for us and it's better for us. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, don't allow those prayers of ours that are not good for us to come true. I'll give you one example of a prayer that came true and the people who were involved with it wished that it did not or had not come true. It was this family that was praying and asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for a child for many years. They didn't have children. Okay. So they kept asking and asking and asking and learning different methods of asking and doing tawassul. They went to all the imams tawassul. It didn't happen. They weren't given. Then somebody said, uh, go to this one Imam Zada. I don't know which Imam Zada, which son of the Imam it was, but they said, you know, this one, whatever you go, they give you. So they went to this particular Imam Zada and they did tawassul and that was what was required. They asked in that way, Allah gave them a child. Right? The child, they were very happy they got this child. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed them with a the child and uh, he grew cute little child, then he grew a little older, then when he got 10 years old, there is this very, very, very tragic accident right before the eyes of the parents. That child was just torn to pieces, okay, right in front of their eyes. At that point, they wished they had never prayed for that child, okay, to see that happen in that way. Just for 10, day, 10 years, okay, 10 years they had that child, and then they had to live with the sorrow and the pain of having that child for the rest of their lives. Sometimes, well, this is a simple example, there are a lot of worse things that sometimes we pray for, we work for, and God gives it to us, but it's not good for us. So we want to make those du'as, we've got to make sure that we make the right du'a. When we want to ask Asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala about certain things that we need, sometimes we know what we need. Okay. There are certain needs of ours we already know. Okay. We know we we need certain material blessings from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Certain sustenance that needs to come from him. We know that. Alright. We don't need to be told of that. Then there are certain things that we don't know we should be asking for. Right. I'm trying to explain the reason why we go to the Ahlul Bayt to even learn du'a. Right? As I said, sometimes people, I think we had this before, sometimes people, their relationship with the du'as of the Ahlul Bayt is in this way, that they think that we need to use those words. It's a certain combination of letters and words. If you say it, then it's going to have its effect. So they always ask, I have a headache, what's the du'a for that? I have a stomach ache, what the du'a for that is? 
I need a car, is there any dua for that? I need a job, is there any dua? I want to take an exam, is there dua for that? Loads of different things, people ask for duas. Okay. The reason why the duas are there, some of the Ahlul Bayt emphasize on, and some of the ulama tell us about this, they tell us, look, <laughs> The best, one of the best ways to do du'a is to use your own language. To speak to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in your own way. This is very important in itself. We have to make that connection. I actually ask Him for something that I feel the need of. As soon as I feel the need for it, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It said that Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam, he used to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even for the salt of his food. Dua. To realize that this comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because we actually do need him. Even for that little very insignificant part of our life that doesn't really look like something very important in our lives. We are needy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in all of that. But we just don't realize it. One of the ways we can realize it better is through Asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the Prophet used to ask. It's good, we're told, to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with our own words, in our own language. You don't necessarily need to look for something Arabic and read it and half, you know, understand maybe half of it, or a third of it, or a quarter of it, or not even five words of it. Okay, sometimes when we read dua, this is how it is. We don't need to look for that. We can ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for what we need in our own words. So what are these du'as from the Ahlul Bayt for? A couple of things. Sometimes we are taught to pray for things that if it wasn't from the Ahlul Bayt, we wouldn't have known that these are very serious things to ask for. There's plenty of those. Plenty of those, inshallah, we'll get to. But another thing is that even when it comes to our needs, we don't know how to ask sometimes. Okay. We ask for too much, maybe. We ask for the wrong thing. The need is there, but we ask for is for the wrong thing. So, what we learn from the du'as of the Ahlul Bayt is exactly what to ask for in regards to those needs that we identify. And then secondly, if you remember the, the talk that we gave yesterday, sometimes the call of our heart is different than the call that our mouth and our tongue is making. We want to make sure, if we're calling for the right thing, if we're asking for the right blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that our heart and our mouth are speaking the right or the same thing. They're asking for the same blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We want to make sure that that happens. And therefore, when we look at the du'as of the Ahlul Bayt, we don't only learn what to ask verbally, we learn how to approach it and how to look for it and how to move about to try to acquire that blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that the call of our heart is exactly the way it should be. Recite a salawat please. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad So with that intro I want to go over one of the du'as. We're starting with this one du'a from Imam al-Sajjad salamu Allah Allahumma salli ala Muhammad there are so many things that the Ahlul Bayt have taught us through du'as. Sometimes people think that what did you know, Imam al-Sajjad was just a worshipper. Zainul Abideen. He prostrated. He prayed. But what we have from Imam al-Sadr for instance or Imam al-Baqir is that they have shared a lot of knowledge with us. And Imam al-Sajjad was just in the corner worshipping. The Imam has taught us so much through the du'as that he has made. In fact, he has taught us things that are a lot of times not found in many of or much of the other heritage that we have from the Ahlul Bayt. Very, very deep knowledge. Very deep. One of these du'as is about sustenance. All right. It's one of the needs that we identify. We identify, we have material needs, whether it's food, shelter, clothing, money, we want to travel, transportation. We have these needs. You need to have capital, you need to have money 
to live. We understand. Okay. We want to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for it, whether it's the verbal call, we want to ask Him for something, or our actions, what we want to go about and try to prepare ourselves to receive this blessing, or the work that we do, for example, the type of job and occupation. We want to make sure it's the right way. The Imam teaches us many lessons. I'll start with this dua. He says, Allahumma ni as'aluka husna al-ma'isha. I ask you, O oh Allah, to give me a good life. Everybody's looking for a good life. You want to have an enjoyable life. Right? Nobody likes a miserable life. Nobody likes to live under hardship. Everybody likes to have a good, prosperous life. Whether you're Muslim, non-Muslim, Shia, non-Shia, atheist, whatever. Everybody in the world is looking for a better life. You ask anyone, they'll tell you that. Okay. I don't think there's anyone that's going to turn around and say, you know what, no, actually I don't want a better life. But then they, their definition of a better life can be very drastically different. If you ask Amir al-Mu'mineen, for example, what his definition of a prosperous life, a good life in this world and the hereafter is, it's going to be very, very different then if you ask an atheist, if you ask some of the enemies of Islam. So what we defer on sometimes is on the definition of prosperity, the definition of a good life. So the Imam doesn't leave it at that. He teaches us, when he wants to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he teaches us what type of a good life we should intend, we should want from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He says the following, he says, First thing, there's many needs that I have. Sometimes I am ill, I need medication, I need money to be able to do that. In this day and age, we need insurance in this country. Okay, maybe if we were in a different country, citizens of Canada, for example, you wouldn't need that so much, if, if I've been informed correctly. Or in some other countries. But in this country, you definitely need insurance. Okay. Unless you want to pay big bucks when you get ill. You need that money to be able to get medication. You need the money to be able to provide. There's these needs that we have. Food, shelter, both, all... So he says, I want a life that I'm able to provide for all of my needs first. But then he doesn't leave it at that. All right. But even right now, let me uh, sit. The important thing, the key word, is this hawa'iji, needs. All right. Keep that in mind. Needs are different than a lot of other things that we get involved. Inshallah, we'll get to the rest of this dua and we'll see what the imam means by that. It says, وَأَتَوَصَّلُ بِهَا فِي الْحَيَاةِ إِلَىٰ آخِرَةِ That I have, I take care of all my needs, but then the objective of my life, why I want that house, why I want the clothing, why I want the transport transportation, why I want to be cured if I'm ill, if I fall ill, all of that is to be able to get to my afterlife, to get to my real life. Okay, this is very important. What our objective in life is. For many of us, we talk about paradise, we talk about hell, we talk about life after death, we talk about a lot of this stuff. But our real objective in life is the dunya. We actually work for this world. We want money for this world. That's the objective. <laughs> we want that car for this world. We want that ticket for luxury in this world. Everything is about this world. All right? The Imam teaches us, look, get it straight in your head. Don't waste your life for this dunya. Do not waste your life for this dunya, because no matter how long it is, it's temporary. It doesn't last. You know, we don't review sometimes the cost and benefit of living for this dunya. 
lot of times we work very hard, work our tails off. And we're able to gain, eventually, in our 40s, maybe sometimes, we're able to have that very luxurious, you know, all that money, everything is set, alhamdulillah, now I'm all set to go. I can enjoy life. Well, now you're going to have to start worrying about becoming diabetic. Now you're going to have to watch out for your cholesterol. Now you're going to have to be careful where you go. You want to play sports, you could break your ankle, you could break it, you could tear a tendon. A lot easier. Okay. You want to get, get engaged in a lot of different activities, then you can't. Okay. Or eventually you can't. As much as some people want to look, look young, you know, they go through all that plastic surgery, some of those politicians as well. Okay. No matter what you do, you're aging. Okay. There's a lot in this day and age to try to move away from aging. Okay. But the fact is, okay, maybe you can make yourself look young for another 10 years, 20 years. Okay. You want to look good for 100 years? Okay, let's just give you 100 years. 200 years? Okay, 200 years. There is an end to it. Okay. It doesn't remain. No matter how long it is. If it comes to an end. Have you thought about what's going to happen after? What about that life that doesn't have an ending? Have we worked anything on that? There's an interesting story. It's very, very... I think it brings thought and wisdom to one. Prophet Nuh, I don't think any of us has lived or will live as long as Prophet Nuh. Okay. The Holy Quran says, before the storm, before the rain, before the flood, he propagated, only his propagation was 950 years. This is fact, because it's in the Quran. All right. He must have lived sometime before then. How many hundred years, I don't know exactly. Then, the flood was not the end of it. No, afterwards he lived for some time as well. Some figures say 2,500 years. Now, I don't know how accurate that is. But what's fact is, at the very least, let's just add another 50 years, a thousand years, okay? Any of us gonna live for a thousand years? Uh, you have that hope? Maybe a hundred? <laughs> maybe. Pushing. Uh, pushing. <laughs> pushing it a bit, maybe a hundred. Okay, Prophet Nuh, when the angel Jibra'il came to the Israel, alayhi salam, the angel that is a very, very kind and merciful and very obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we're very scared of. Okay. May Allah bless him. When he came to take the soul of Prophet Nuh, Prophet Nuh was standing under the sun. Okay. And he asked the angel, can I step in the shade? He said, yeah, God has allowed you that one. You can go. Because sometimes he doesn't even allow that. You have to go. You don't get an option. But this time, this is a prophet. He's got connections. <laughs> so then, the angel asks him, you've lived for 2,500 years. How does that feel? How does that feel? 2,500 years. Okay, let's just say that for years. Or 1,000 years. How does that feel? He said, you know that step I just took from the sun into the shade? It all feels like that. I'm looking at my life. I don't live no thousand years. All right, a lot less than that. It's just two digits. Okay, <laughs> haven't even filled the 99 years of the two, two digits. But uh, really, I can't believe so many years have passed by, and it just—it's—it's it's just an image in my head. That's it. It's all gone. All gone. The rest of it will be the same. Before you know it, I'll be 40, 50, 60. If I live that long, you know? Gone. Don't work, it's not worth it. This dunya is not worth it. This is hadith. The Imam had some food. <coughs> Someone came and asked. He gave, I don't know, like three fourths of it away. And they only had one fourth left. I'm throwing out a, faith, a figure there. But most of it apparently, from what I remember, was. And the one who was there, the companion that accompanied the Imam, told him, you know, that's all that's left. 
he said, actually, this is all that this is the only part of it that is actually gone. What we have kept is what we gave away. That's going to stay with us. That's something that's long term. That's not gone. This is gone. This world is not worth it. The Imam says, try to set your priorities, your goals, your standard in life. That I want this, yes, I want to take care of my needs because if I can't take care of my health, I can't worship right. Zaidullah Mishkini, may Allah bless his soul, he passed away a few years ago. I saw him up close once. He looked very, extremely weak. And he was telling us, look, take care of your bodies when you're young. Because when you get old, if you haven't, you're not going to be able to worship. Now, he wants to worship, so said, I can't. I'm too weak right now. He said, when we were younger, Ayla Bihishti used to have kebabs once a week. Okay. He used to spend money and buy meat, and we'd be like, that's in Iran at that time before the revolution for a house student. That's, uh, that's, that's not the way Amir al would live his life. A dry bread. But now I understand why he would do that. He needs to take care of that body. Okay. I'm not trying to say you have kebab once a week. <laughs> okay. But you need to take care of that body. But what for? Right? In order to be able to serve, the, the dua in Dua Qumail says, I want to have a strong body, a healthy body, but not to go and party in Vegas, but to serve you. This is what I want to do. So, Then something scary for myself. Without you causing me to become one of the mutrafeen. Okay. Sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us a lot of wealth. Tons of wealth. There's different ways that people deal with it. One way people deal with it is to sit on it. Okay, it's mine. And I just want to use it for my own. I want to increase it first of all. I don't want to I'm always checking like where I can put it, what bank or what bond or what stocks I can, whatever, that I can be able to increase it. I don't want it to just sit there. And on top of that, if I want to spend it, I want to spend it for my own luxury and for my own uh, better worldly dunya we life. This is referred to as mutrafin, like a scary term. If you look at the Holy Quran, if you read the Arabic, mutrafin are not looked at very good in the Holy Quran. Usually when the prophets came, the mutrafin were part of the team that went against the prophets. Okay, like Qarun is one of the mutrafin. Qarun is a clear example of a mutraf. Now, in another verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, when we want to destroy and wipe off the map an entire nation, an entire people, we tell, we instruct the mutrafin to do certain things, and they end up getting involved with fisq, and they move the entire population towards fisq, and that's, what, that's how we come in wipe everybody off. This feeling of just looking for comfort and joy, worldly joy and comfort. And that's the objective in life. And that just, that ease in life, that luxury, that comfort, and I'm paying for it and I'm feeling it, and I can't give it up. That's how we become Mutrafi. And the result of that is, the Imam says, فَأَطْغَى That I rebel. Too much causes one to rebel. Not to listen to the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala anymore. Imam of our time comes. You, get, you know, we really have to test ourselves. We really have to test ourselves. Right? How committed are we to the Imam? Picture yourself. I don't know how many times we actually think of this. How many times we actually think of this. 
We come in Muharram, we shed tears, we cry, all of that. Okay, that's great. But let's put ourselves in those shoes, okay? The Imam is going towards Kufa. People don't want to join him. Why? Very simple reasoning. Because it's clear the Imam is not going to be able to rule. He's going to be attacked. And the chances of him women winning are very, very slim. Like, I have a life to take care of. I have a family to take care of. I have this. I have that. They didn't go with the Imam. One of the reports says that some of the people who even liked the Imam, they came, very <coughs> shaking report, says they came out of Kufa. They came close to Karbala. They're watching the battlefield. They love the Imam to the extent they're watching from a distance what is happening, how the enemy is treating the Imam, arrows being thrown at them, being oppressed, seeing all of that, they're even shedding tears. One of the enemy says, I was passing by, I saw them doing this. I said, may the curse of God be on you. If you think the man needs help, why don't you go forward and help him? Am I really going to be able to give all of that up and go say, I want to go to the Imam. And I want to put my body in front of him and I want to protect him. Arrows come and take it with my body like the companion did in Karbala. We're really willing to do that. If the Imam of our time comes and said, I need all of your money to spend for the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How many of us are going to be, without questioning, without questioning the way the true companions were? There's one report that's found in Manatubu Ala Abi Talib, if I remember correctly. This report says that one of the Ahlul Bayt was approached, if I remember correctly, maybe it was Imam al Rada or maybe one of the previous Imams. He was approached by the people. Some of the Shias, they had come to him from Khurasan, some part of Iran or Afghanistan, because it included much of both, if I got that right. So anyhow, they, he's come to him, why don't you have an uprising? You have plenty of supporters. The Imam says, how many supporters? He says, 100,000. He says, 100,000 supporters? He says, no, even twice that much. The Imam said, really? Yeah. Okay, if that's the case, See that oven there? It's hot. Go sit in the oven. Are you kidding me? I said you have supporters. We'll go and fight. I didn't say I'll go get barbecued in that oven. Okay. While they were having this conversation, a true companion came in. The imam told him such and such, go to the oven. Without asking, without sitting, without... Went directly... He went inside and he closed the door. Or if it had a lid. Otherwise, just jumped in there. Okay. And the Imam starts, he starts this conversation. So, how are things in Khurasan? How are your kids? How are your family doing? And this guy's like worried. Like, What's going on? You know, the mom, that guy, can you take him out? <laughs> After a while, he says, go check on him. He goes and sees him. He says, he's sitting there saying dhikr. That fire's not going to burn him. I think the Imam will tell you to do something that's going to harm you. For no reason, something ridiculous. Okay, how much trust do you have? If the Imam comes and says, "Give me all of it," will I be willing to actually give it all without question? Easily, it is yours. It doesn't actually belong to me. It actually belongs to God, and you're His representative. You say that it's you need it for that. I mean, I need to give it. Here you go, all of it. I'm willing to give my life as well. If there's anything I can do, please. Are we willing to do? This is and tatufani fiha fa Do not, please, don't give me to the extent that I will become a mutrif and it will cause me to rebel against Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. And then he continues with that, which inshallah we'll have to continue the following session. Sallallahu alaihi Ya Ahla Bayt al-Nubu'ah Wa mawda'ah al-Risala Wa mahbita وخزان العلم و
May Allah's peace and blessings be upon you. My beloved Holy Prophet and the Ahlul Bayt. May Allah's 